Hello everybody and welcome back to my top 30 games of the decade. If you haven't seen part 1, give it a look via the link in the description. As a reminder, this list is based solely on my personal opinion and the rules on screen do apply. Without further ado, let's jump into the middle entries. Number 20, Cuphead. In an era where graphics are racing toward hyper-realism and film studios are leaning heavily on 3D animation, there's a hole in our nostalgic hearts for classic art styles. Studio MDHR went above and beyond answering the call by emulating 1930s animation with rubber hose techniques popularized by the likes of Popeye and Steamboat Willie, using it as a vehicle for a run-and-gun boss rush. My kind of game, right? You better believe it. The gorgeous hand-drawn art runs at a film standard 24 frames while the game runs at a buttery smooth 60. The combat is mixed up with multiple shoot styles, ultimate moves, and passive skills, not to mention the various hazards, boss mechanics, and platforming challenges that make up each stage. Your performance is graded on a number of important gameplay factors that vary depending on the chosen difficulty. Speaking of difficulty, Cuphead was deceptively tough. Though this caters to the masochistic market, it was a stark contrast from the game's universally appealing art style. While I'm sure this alienated casual admirers of Cuphead's animation, I personally had a blast getting my mug shattered time and time again until I could rise to the challenge. Nearly every boss has excellent balance, differentiates itself well from its peers, and the eye candy is ever present win or lose. Cuphead oozes charm, provides polished combat with surprising depth, boasts tremendous boss design across the board, and plays beautifully to an energetic score matching the era it pays homage to. While I personally felt the run and gun levels were a weak addition that could have been axed for more bosses with your earned score awarding coins instead, there is much to dislike here. Cuphead being number 20 isn't to say that it has gaping flaws, but stands as a shining example of how incredible the best games of the decade are. Number 19, Dark Souls. If we were ranking the most influential game of the decade, Dark Souls has a strong argument for top honors. With respect to Demon Souls for providing the blueprint, Dark Souls brought core development ideas to the table that spread like wildfire throughout the decade. There's examples as recent as Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Its meditation spots are a twist on the bonfire progression system. Resting acts as a checkpoint and replenishes healing items at the cost of respawning all enemies. It's a brilliant trade-off that frames level design around a finite resource in healing. Think of healing as an extension of a massive singular health bar. That makes it so skill, game knowledge, and execution defines each player's variable success within each level. There are other similarities like dropping XP upon death, and there are plenty of differences too. But the point here is that modern games to this day are still borrowing design ideas that originated in Dark Souls. Whether games take inspiration to innovate or desperately try to imitate, there's something valued above all else in Dark Souls that is rarely replicated perfectly. It's difficulty. All the Bandicoot Souls and related memes spawn from the idea that if a game is hard, it becomes like Souls. Outside of the silly industry comparisons, it's not hard to understand why Dark Souls is synonymous with difficulty. During a time when major publishers bent over back to make games accessible to the widest audience possible, Dark Souls was unapologetically challenging. While the sentiment Get Good may be used sparingly as an elitist chant for narcissists to lord their fragile egos over others, the term has a more earnest meaning. It encourages an exponentially increasing number of people to persevere through the many challenges Dark Souls throws at you no matter how many times you fail. Miyazaki himself is on record stating he never wanted to make a hard game, but he understands that creating a seemingly insurmountable challenge brings an equally mountainous level of euphoria upon victory. Of course, it isn't as simple as making things hard, and that's where Miyazaki's brilliant shines. It's about finding a way to make challenges feel fair in the face of failure, which is really, really tough because self-awareness varies from person to person. While you or I might be able to admit our greed when spamming our one in lieu of dodging, another player might shout, I dodged that, this game is BS, and promptly quit. In the face of those odds, FromSoft was bold enough to deliver a challenging experience in an era where most were playing it safe. While there certainly are people who think Dark Souls difficulty is rigged, and it does have its fair share of cheap shots, the overall challenge is balanced in a way that resonated with self-aware players who have the humility to recognize their mistakes and use them as learning experiences to persevere, to get good. It's an age-old life lesson, to not fear failure and to understand that every failure leads you closer to success. That's difficult to capture in a medium where most seek it out only for entertainment, one where losing isn't considered fun. But in Dark Souls, it was. Every death brought me closer to linking the flame, and because of the outstanding design of most of the obstacles to that end, that victory was one of the sweetest of the decade. 
With all this mighty praise, you might be wondering why Dark Souls isn't higher. Despite its influence and in reshaping my view on difficulty in video games, its incredible music, world design, bosses, etc., it's still got plenty of warts. The gameplay is janky by today's standards, especially when compared to the studio's later work. The second half of the game falls off a quality cliff outside of the DLC and final boss. Even with the thoughtful design, there are a handful of sections that are more frustrating than fun, and its performance made some sections nearly unplayable until the remaster. But in spite of its flaws, it's easily one of the most influential games of the decade, and it's my personal favorite of the Dark Souls trilogy. Number 18, The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. I did promise some spicy takes. To spell out the implication, Skyward Sword existing on this list by rule means the other Zelda juggernaut of the decade, Breath of the Wild, cannot. Obviously we're all entitled to our own opinions, but I'm confident I'm in a significant minority when I say Skyward Sword is the best Zelda game of the decade. Breath of the Wild is an excellent game, don't get me wrong. I played it from top to bottom, I've done all 120 shrines, I've beaten the champion's ballad, trial of the sword multiple times, I've done all the notes side quests, hell, I've even beaten Ganon in under an hour in the nude. So I feel confident I've put enough playtime in when I say that Breath of the Wild is a game that emphasizes quantity over quality. This is a frustrating design philosophy that I feel is shared to an even greater extent by Mario Odyssey. For every compelling moon or shrine, there's forgettable content to match. It's almost as if the game doesn't expect you to bother doing everything, making it a tiresome effort for completionists. The enemy variety is disappointing. The weapon degradation is a chore to manage. Shrines were out there welcome far before before you reach 50, let alone 120. The important story events outside of the climax take place in the past, making me wish I was playing during that era. The champions are underdeveloped without the DLC and are one-note stereotypes. The combat is trivial with perfect dodges and the ability to pause and heal at any time. Dealing with rain is a chore. The lack of true dungeons is disappointing. The divine beasts are boring, bloated shrines. The bosses lack creativity, variety, and can be beaten easily by hammering away with easy-to-obtain arrows. And finally, while the exploration sends of wonder and relaxed journey through Hyrule is a compelling reason to overlook all of the things I just mentioned, it is enough to keep it from reaching the heights of its predecessor in my eyes. Oh yeah, this is about Skyward Sword. Let's talk about that, shall we? Out of the box, your enjoyment of Skyward Sword hinged on your disposition for motion controls and whether or not they worked for you. Some folks swore up and down that the motion controls were atrocious and were faulty no matter what they did. I can only offer my own personal experience, but I never had this problem. And I've played this game in its entirety four different times with three different Wiimotes on two separate Wiis and a PC from a foot away with a USB sensor bar. I needed to recalibrate and center the cursor periodically, sure, but the controls were never an issue. As for my disposition, I didn't even like the Wii or the idea of motion controls, but if Nintendo was going to go that route, I was happy they finally bothered to fully integrate it into one of their flagship franchises. They made combat centered around parrying or blocking with your shield and attacking from certain angles with motion control to beat your enemy. There are also tons of items to gain along the way that make use of these controls in various creative ways. The dungeons, bosses, side quests, world exploration, every bit of the game is crafted to use motion control and for the most part it was a magical, one-of-a-kind experience. I was engrossed in the overarching story of Hyrule's creation, the genesis of the everlasting conflict between Link, Zelda, and Ganon, and the cast of characters are memorable with solid character development all around. I also have to say that I feel that the design of the bosses and dungeons in this game are collectively some of the best right along Twilight Princess. The one common complaint I do wholeheartedly agree with though is the distinct for Fee. Her frequent hand-holding is intrusive and irritating. It's a shame they made a key character associated with such an annoying mechanic because I feel like she would have been likable otherwise. Admittedly, the late game level design is lacking with the ham-fisted reuse of the same three worlds, and despite loving the motion controls on the whole, there were a few times it felt awkward such as swimming. All of this is to say, I understand the game's flaws and why you might choose Breath of the Wild for your own list. But for me, the story, characters, combat, unique controls, dungeons, bosses, items, world, and overall creativity hit all the right chords as the best Zelda game of the decade. Number 17, Death Stranding. I'm sure at least one person watching is thinking to themselves, he didn't put Dark Souls 1 or 3 in the top 10, Skyward Sword is ranked over Breath of the Wild, and now this Kojima fanboy has the audacity to put Death Stranding above it all? Yes. Yes I do. If you wanted the safest, least polarizing list possible, I'm positive there are other videos out there serving predictability up. The real tragedy is that I feel the need to be on the defensive before I even talk about Death Stranding in a positive light. I spent hours upon hours reading reviews, fan impressions, and let it all simmer over the last two months to shape up my own thoughts on Death Stranding. And I love it. 
By all measures of this game's elevator pitch, it should be conceptually one of the most boring games ever created, but I kept an open mind and was rewarded with one of the most unique gaming experiences of the decade for it. As I'd make simple deliveries, countless thoughts would be flying through my head. How many deliveries should I take on this time? Do I need ladders, climbing ropes, uh, maybe I should bring weapons in case I run into BTs or mules. Actually, is there any way I can avoid them? Maybe by vehicle, or maybe if I go on foot? Can I avoid time fall if I go that way though? How will I get past this river? I should probably also check how my stamina is doing. And maybe I should check the terrain with the Audra deck in real time to see where I'm going. But maybe I should go over there and get that lost cargo real quick. Also, I should probably make note of that bridge because I'd love to come back and help finish building it. Every delivery you make like this connects you to more of the world. The more you connect, the more gear you get access to, awarding you with a constant drip of fresh ways to approach deliveries and enemies. My previous inner monologue might sound tedious, but in the moment, it all crystallized into a puzzle where the terrain between point A and B are the pieces, and my strategy is the solution. And the best part is, there is no single best answer. When you tie it in with the characters you meet along the way, it gives a real sense of gravity to your quest. The story is convoluted, the dialogue is laughably bad at times, and someone needs to ban Kojima from using exposition dumps. Truly, the man has a lot of interesting things to say and needs to figure out an interesting way to say it. But while he struggles with cohesion, his themes are thought-provoking and his world-building is exceptional. An example is the episodic structure that develops the motivations of key characters and reveals their relationship with death, a major theme of the game. Whether profound or B-movie laughable, I was entertained all the same. This is helped by the phenomenal graphics, assisted by motion capture that makes the most of the stellar acting across the board, especially from Mads Mikkelsen and Norman Reedus who steal the show. The soundtrack is one of my favorites of the decade, the terrain changes consistently over the course of the game to raise challenges you obtain new gear, the interconnectivity online helps you and your fellow players rise to meet these challenges together in a remarkable way, and the combat is surprisingly polished for how little it's necessary. My experience in Death Stranding was unlike anything else this decade, and I mean that mostly in the best way possible. It may not be my absolute favorite, but I celebrate Death Stranding for unapologetically delivering delivering on exactly the experience its creator wanted, for better or worse. Number 16, The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. I've been a lot more verbose than usual in the last few entries, but I can't help myself. I get fired up talking about games I'm passionate about. And if we're talking hype, there may be no other game on the entire list I was more excited for prior to release in Skyrim. Almost two decades ago, my friend brought his Xbox in a little game called Morrowind to a sleepover. We spent over 30 hours passing the controller over the course of that weekend in absolute awe at the size and freedom of exploration the game offered. A decade later, I was rocking back and forth in my chair watching the Skyrim trailer on endless repeat until 11 11 11. Dragons have always been atop the mythological coolness charts, so stepping into the shoes of a chosen one archetype that had the power to feast on the souls of dragons to gain their power was a slam dunk. In the first four days, I put 67 hours into the game. Why bother sleeping and eating when you can feed on the souls of dragons? I didn't play RPGs much until I was an adult, and Bethesda really opened that door for me. Skyrim isn't overly complex, the difficulty is pretty low, and the combat is very simple. But the world, characters, and quest line that connected it all had so much personality that I was pulled into exploring every nook and cranny in a way few games have managed to hook me. It's certainly not perfect, what with it showing its age, infamous glitches, and seriously mediocre combat, though I'd be remiss if I didn't shout out the modding scene on PC that has done wonders to touch up its weaker points. Beyond that, I feel the itch Skyrim scratch has been done better by a handful of games to come. Even so, it still holds enough individuality and charm for me to take another ride on the cart to the chopping block any day of the week. Number 15, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. So about that game that scratches the itch, yeah, The Witcher 3 is in many ways a better Skyrim. It's a fantasy RPG with rich quest lines, interesting characters, a massive world to explore, and serviceable combat. The awkward thing is, while I know in my head that The Witcher 3 is a fantastic game, it is probably the game on the list that I have the least to say about. Granted, for comparison's sake, I put at least a thousand hours into Skyrim and only played The Witcher 3 a single time on release back in 2015 and never even got to the DLCs. I remember loving the story, Triss, Yennefer, Ciri, Geralt, were all fantastic characters, I appreciated the choices I made in The Witcher 2 being carried over in meaningful ways, I enjoyed the combat even though it wasn't the strongest suit, I'm always a fan of dialogue trees when they have impact, the many varieties of beasts are great, the Witcher sense during investigations was cool, I liked how much side and collectible content there was, though admittedly kinda like Breath of the Wild, it eventually reached a point of, there's no way I'm doing all of that once I reach Skelligan. Looking at critical reviews from the time to refresh my memory further, I see criticism for lack of innovation in the action RPG genre, which may 
maybe why it isn't standing out noticeably in my memory. The Witcher 3 in hindsight feels like a relatively safe game that pulls features from many successful franchises of the time and refine them into a masterpiece. But let's not pretend like that's some easy feat, it's really impressive. Let's be real, when it comes down to the best 15 games of the last 10 years, we're talking about the pinnacle of gaming. Even if The Witcher 3 is edged out slightly by what's to come, its seal of quality is one of the highest the decade has to offer. And though it didn't stick out for me as much as I'm sure it did for a lot of you, it's well worth a spot in my own top 15. Number 14, Portal 2. This sequel to the surprise hit from the orange box blew my expectations out of the water. Portal 2 blends mind-bending puzzle design, hilarious writing, ominous tension, and a perfectly measured drip of new mechanics throughout its runtime that made it the best puzzle game I've ever played. The game offers new characters and timelines that add additional scope to the world of Aperture Science, spans multiple acts with various climaxes and new puzzle types to keep players engaged, and even introduced a new co-op mode to test with friends. Each aha moment is as satisfying as the the last and it all caps off with an unforgettable boss battle. The only real downside is that repeat playthroughs don't hold the same value due to a nudging feeling that you know the solutions even if it has been some time since you played. But even with that slight caveat, I still manage to have a blast every time I revisit Aperture Science. Number 13, Hotline Miami 2, Wrong Number. Hotline Miami is the chaotic, hyper-violent fever dream I can't get enough of. The killer beats crashed in as fast-paced action meets quick twitch strategy against hordes of bloodthirsty enemies, making shit at the fan the moment you kick that door in so fast that win or lose, you'll be hitting that line again and again until your adrenaline goes into overdrive. The level variety is phenomenal, the art style is vibrant, the soundtrack builds tension while you wait like a cobra ready to strike, the controls are tight, and the enemy placement is thoughtful, increasing difficulty as the game progresses while leaving tons of viable strategies open. The amount of missions is far beyond its predecessor while exceeding its quality, the many different characters that have fully realized story arcs add exceptional variety to the gameplay, and the overarching narrative caught me by complete surprise with its stellar writing. My only complaint to the game is every once in a while the enemy placement feels stacked against you in a frustrating way, and while the AI hits most of the time, it can be missed. But the pros far outweigh the cons, and in my eyes it's one of the most underrated games of the decade by a mile. Number 12, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. The more I look back on Sekiro, the more I find to love. My review of Room for Improvement last summer boiled down to some serious nitpicking, and it's because there's not a lot to complain about. At the time, I had put hundreds of hours into the game over a few months, which admittedly soured my opinion slightly. When I revisited the game recently after a long break, I was shocked at how well it held up for another playthrough. I seamlessly trounced my way through Ashna in a challenge run getting all beads and memories, using a mod giving bosses 2-3 additional health bars, and I loved every second of it. Of Miyazaki's creations, I would say the Sekiro has the largest decline in difficulty once you're accustomed to the combat. That's thanks to the astronomically high level of polish it has. Instead of having to balance multiple builds and play styles, Sekiro takes one style and sculpts it to perfection. There is room for deviation in combat arts and how aggressive you choose to be, but ultimately mastery of deflections and putting your own pressure on is the optimal way to go. Sadly, this alienated players who didn't want to subscribe to that hyper-aggressive playstyle, but if you know me, you know I was an action-adventure bliss. Another point of criticism is lack of replayability compared to the Souls games, and while I do agree, I still got more than my money's worth of entertainment out of my adventures in Ashina. It's a game that I continue to appreciate more with time, and I'm not surprised at all it claims so many Game of the Year awards. As to whether it's mine, you'll have to wait and see. Whether it achieves that honor for me or not, there's no denying it's a heavy hitter to cap the decade. And the final game just outside of the top 10 best games of the decade, number 11, Hollow Knight. If there's any game this decade that paid homage to the Souls series yet managed to have its own identity all the same, it's Hollow Knight. Rich lore with a story primarily told in cryptic ways through the world and characters that inhabit it? Check. Challenge the mostly borders on fair, yet pushes you to the limit, creating a massive sense of accomplishment when you claim victory. Check. A remarkable soundtrack that evokes a wide range of emotion depending on the situation. Check. Excellent combat based around a core of metered aggression between hits and evasion. Check. Open-ended world exploration that culminates in tough boss battles to solidify your journey. Check. Benches that act as bonfire-like checkpoints. Check. A flask that is used for healing and mana, check. Of course, it also borrows a lot from the Metroidvania genre, for better or worse. Though I am a fan of that genre, I do dislike the tropes it's plagued with, such as egregious backtracking and head-spinning level design. I do wish the map in Hollow Knight uncovered gradually as you explored like a lot of other Metroidvanias, even if the map bug is a neat character. I also strongly dislike needing to equip a charm to see yourself on the map. I suppose they wanted it to be a trade-off, but I don't feel like getting lost is ever enjoyable in this game. For me, it didn't feel like exploration in that case, it felt like a tiresome obstacle on the way to the next level. 
because despite the massive map, you are on rails to some extent in the order you need to do things, so getting lost led to some frustrating moments. Fast travel from benches would have been amazing for cutting down backtracking, but instead they opted for the Bug Express. Yet again, neat character, but less time backtracking is more time having fun. The game is also much more painful to navigate in the early stages before you get movement upgrades and make the platforming more fluid. I don't think that has an easy solution, but it is worth a mention. While these complaints are notable enough as an excuse to keep it out of an extremely heated competition for my top 10, they are drops in a bucket of immense quality. The atmosphere is engrossing, the characters radiate personality, the boss roster overall is one of the best, if not the best of the decade, the storytelling while a bit indirect is drenched in a deep lore that is marvelous, the platforming is polished to the highest degree, the endgame challenges offer a lot of value for masochists, and the soundtrack is another contender for best of the decade. On my second playthrough, I decided to use a guide to get the 112% to take the guesswork out of exploration and minimize backtracking, and that is when the game soared to its peak of quality for me. You could say using an external tool to improve the game should count against it, but I was fine with it. It allowed me to take out the overemphasis on what I didn't enjoy as much, the exploration and backtracking, and focus on what I did enjoy, the combat, story, and bosses. If you loved everything I did and the explorative nature hit all the right notes for you, then this game would easily crack the top 10 and likely even the top 5. But despite my gripes, the thing I love about Hollow Knight outweigh them in such a gigantic margin that it nested itself right outside the top 10. But of course, that's just my opinion. Let me know what you thought of today's list, be sure to subscribe for the final part coming soon, and leave a like if you enjoyed the middle entries. I want to thank you all for watching today, much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.